high school, and last year we were given a neon detector by Queen Mary University, and today we'd like to tell you about the research we did with it and how we think we could use time-fixed detectors in the future. Um, so, what are neons? I'm sure most of you know. Um, <laughs> well, obviously you do, but um, <laughs> basically, um, they're heavy versions of electrons, they're unstable, they decay quickly, and because they're produced in the atmosphere, the fact we can detect them because they're short lifetimes um, is evidence for special relativity. Um, and this is the decay of a muon. Um, and this is a photo of our detector. Um, and basically, it, was, um, it had a scintillator in it, which um, emits light when a muon passes through it, which then gets converted into a current by a photomultiply tube. Um, which then gets kind of sent to a computer. And there are two signals in the detector. The first is when the muon enters it, and, and the second is and the second is when um, the muon decays if decay happens. Um, and there are two settings on the detector that we can change. And the first is the detector's voltage, which basically talks about um, which is to do with how much energy the muon needs to have in order to be detected. And so a higher voltage means that lower energy muons can be detected. And the second is the detector's threshold, which doesn't affect what the detector actually picks up, but it um, determines what data is kept out of all the mules um, picked up. So we wanted to look into um, how the threshold setting of the detector actually affects how much we can allow on the results. Um, so we kept the voltage constant at its highest as our control, um, and then changed the voltage, uh, and then changed the threshold, sorry, and then ran the detector for 24 hours each threshold, and you can look at the number of muons um, per threshold. So when the threshold was high, fewer muons were um, the data for fewer muons were kept, so it was much more selective. And then um, for lower thresholds, um, the data for many, many more muons was kept. Um, actually, there shouldn't be that many muons going through the detector, um, so the data isn't accurate at all because it's just counting loads of things that aren't muons going through the detector as muons. Um, and so to work out to what extent this is the case, um, we looked at the lifetime of a muon because we can cut because the detector. Um, will cause decays as well as muons just entering. It means we can use that data to calculate the lifetime of a muon, and then we can calculate the lifetime per threshold. Um, so um, when the threshold was from five and above, the lifetime um, we calculated from the data was right, so we know we can trust that data, um, and that it was counting muons. But for lower thresholds, um, the lifetime calculated was completely wrong. So for threshold four, it was slightly off, but for threshold 3.5, it was completely wrong. So um, the data from threshold 3.5 and below just isn't good data at all. Um, yeah. <laughs> so um, the muon decays follow a Poisson distribution, which is exponential. And to work out the average lifetime, we had to um, fit to our data um, to get the uh, lifetime constant, which is lambda in that equation. Um, but we couldn't find a program that would reliably fit to an exponential curve, so we ended up converting our values to logarithms, which is why the graph you saw earlier is a straight line. Um, so by doing that, and uh, doing a straight line fit, we could extract our value for the mean lifetime, which was 2.2 plus or minus the 0.04 microseconds, and the published value falls well within these error bounds, so we can say our value is consistent. So in 1933, Enrico Fermi introduced the Fermi coupling constant, uh, which basically describes the relative strength of a weak nuclear force. And this value came about from um, Fermi's interaction, which describes beta decay. Um, so as you can see from this diagram, Fermi thought that this is the case that would happen, where the muon couples to the electron, the anti-electron neutrino, and the muon neutrino. Um, and so in order for this to happen, um, the decay would be instantaneous, but that would mean such a boson would have to have infinite mass. Now we know this isn't the case because in 1983, CERN found the W boson, which has a mass of around a copper atom, so that was wrong, and the model was updated to this. Um, oh, that should go back. So um, the Fermi coupling constant is the probability of the vertex occurring. Um, so this is the updated decay, um, whereby the muon couples to the W boson, um, which is mediated by the weak force, and then that couples to the electron and the anti-electron neutrino. Um, so the probability that the vertex occurs um, is 
given by a value that can be calculated from the Fermi coupling constant. And similarly, the vertex for the W boson uh, coupled to the electron and the anti electron neutrino can also be worked out from the Fermi, Fermi coupling constant. So, our value that we worked out and we calculated using the equation um, in the slide was 1.16 plus or minus 0.02 times 10 to the minus 5 giga electron volts to the minus 2. And as you can see, our value is within the error balance of the published value, and so we can say that our value is consistent, which is good. So the Fermi coupling constant is related to something called the Higgs vacuum expectation value through this equation. Um, the vacuum expectation value of a field is like its lowest possible energy state where it's stable or like its ground state. So we used our value of the Fermi coupling constant to calculate uh, the vacuum expectation value of the Higgs field. And as a side note, the vacuum expectation value can also be used to uh, predict the mass of the W boson, which Giulini just talked about. Um, so this is our value, and again the published value is well within our error bounds. Um, so our value is consistent. But actually this value is quite strange, because the vacuum expectation value of a normal field, you would expect it to be zero, but we actually got a really high value. Um, so this suggests that the Higgs field is more of a Mexican hat shape than a typical like potential well. Um, and since the expectation value is far from the center, um, and this can be used to explain spontaneous symmetry breaking, which is used in grand unified theories, um, where at high energies, um, the electromagnetic weak nuclear force and strong nuclear force unite and become one, but then at lower energies they split into the forces we see today. And that's because when the field is given higher energy, um, it's sort of promoted to the top of that hill, so there's perfect symmetry all around, but then when it falls to lower energies, the symmetry is broken, so it falls into the valley and there's no longer any symmetry. Um, so what could we do next? Well, we, another group from our school um, used, tried to angle our detector to try and work out the angular distribution of muons. So that's the, the angles that the muons are coming from most. But um, we couldn't really get any conclusive results just by angling our detector. So we, what we want to do is to use either one time pix detector and our detector in conjunction with it separated by a small distance um, and then connect it to an Arduino and try and record simultaneous events. Um, and then we could also put um, um, shielding in between the two detectors to filter out uh, background stuff. And that would also, that would filter um, muons traveling perpendicular to our detectors. But actually, um, what we heard in the talk earlier was that the uh, time picks detector three can actually, it has like depth, so it can, we might be able to use that to measure the angles that muons are coming from just on its own, <coughs> so we wouldn't need two detectors. Um, so we think that will be something good to do in the future, if we will be allowed to use a time fix three. <laughs> <laughs> so thank you all for listening. Um, we'd like to thank our physics teachers, in particular Dr. Coloni, for helping us um, and also thank you to Becky Parker and everyone who organised this today for letting us uh, show our research. Really? Thank you.